Who bit the original chip into your cold shoulder to make you really think you could become a professional photographer? Was it dear old mom and dad spinning in their still living postmodern graves of corporatized work, screaming at you to get a real job? Was it the sickly, slick influencers of the floppy hat wedding photo takers copying and pasting their shared doctrine to your social media sow feeds 15 seconds at a time? Was it you? Do you really think you deserve to be called some sort of artist or creative? All of these intrusive thoughts collect collateral in your head like a drunk driver plowing through the Sunday morning farmer's market, but it doesn't matter now anyway. You're a stubborn bastard in a saturated market, and for some reason, you decide to give your whole life to scraping together a living while imaging others' realities. Your own health and well-being be damned. And in the daily mantra you recite to yourself before the dawn light breaks as you clutch your camera like a bucked-out jarhead's rifle, so you assure yourself, while my physical form may pass on soon, I only really die once the last kind eyes lie across my Instagram feed. Or is this just a reflection of myself? I don't really know you, what you're actually thinking, who you are, what your story is. Don't worry, I'm sure you're some unique entity all your own. There's no one like you, and there never will be again. Yes, 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 yes. I just know what camera system you carry, and I know the idea I'll try to sell you on right now. We're only here for as long as the average attention span can manage, so let's get down to the main unsolicited piece of advice that I'm going to pass through the digital entertainment algorithms. If you shoot Fujifilm professionally, the 16 to 55 millimeter and the 50 to 140 millimeter are the two tools of the trade that I carry the most often to help make my living, and they might be the right holy implements for your divine creativity too. Or not. Well, let's talk. What? Why are you looking at me like I'm crazy? No, I'm not going to tell you how much I make as a photographer, tell you how to maximize your profits with stock images, or sell you on some sort of course on how to start a photo business. That's common and douchey and predatory behavior for a career path that's so unique to so many people. No, today is more of a reflection about using the Fujifilm XF 16-55 and 50-140mm f2.8 lenses as a photography professional, and what my experience has been over the past few years using them in both personal and in client work. So let's set the stage. I currently shoot with two bodies, the X-T4 and the X-Pro3, since they have very similar sensors and performance, and I know the X-Pro3 has gotten a lot of flack since it first came out because of its fold-down hidden screen and slightly minimalistic button and dial layout, but I honestly have no problem shooting this just as fast as I do my fully kitted out X-T4 body now that I've gotten used to the body and its unique controls. Plus. It just looks pretty. That being said, I usually mount the 16-55mm on the X-Pro3 body and mount the 50-140mm to on my X-T4 body to take advantage of both cameras' ideal balance with these lenses. But honestly, the 50-140 to is just as easy to use on the X-Pro3 body, even though it will definitely have more front-heavy bias like a portly man taking the first seat of a two-person canoe. This doesn't actually have that large of an impact, however, since I recently switched over to a dual camera sling system from Black Rapids, which is definitely a back, a neck, and a camera saver. And it does a very nice job quickly deploying and storing two camera bodies on your person with the ability to mount the quarter inch loops wherever you want instead of having to rely on custom plates or lug mounts like Peak Design. Okay, that's great, but why these two lenses in particular are not the superior quality of the prime lens? You say to yourself, looking up carefully from caressing your Fujinon 1.4 primes to adjust your turquoise bolo tie and custom wide brimmed leather hat to just the right jaunty angle for an intellectual fight. Well, first off, choose a better personality app 
Second off, there are plenty of personal and professional reasons that I have a sick affinity to these zoom lenses. Most of the time, I really just can't justify the extra stops of light that I achieve with Fujifilm's older f1.4 primes if I have to stop them down to around f2 to 2.8 anyway just to get the same performance of my f2.8 zooms wide open. Now, don't get me wrong. Prime lenses do have their place in professional workflows for many people, and they can capture a certain look that even the best 2.8 zooms can't. But the older Fujifilm 1.4s are just a little too soft when they're wide open, negating any positive aesthetic effects of shallower depth of field, especially if I have to spend hours running all of my images through Topaz AI sharpener just to get usable image quality like 60% of the time. Plus, I really just don't have the luxury of buying an entire set of primes just to constantly juggle them in and out during a paid shoot where time literally equals money. Nowadays, a lot of my shoots have been partially outdoor portrait sessions, but mostly event coverage based work ranging from anything from large concerts to small gatherings. And depending on the venue and how things are set up, it's always better for me to have the range of these two zooms that I need at a moment's notice since oftentimes these are very dynamic environments and I don't always get to study a cue or set list to know what's happening next. I mean, especially in performing arts, the stage can be a very wide and deep area where planned or impromptu actions can happen either in the far corners or sucker punch you right on the lip of the stage. And if you're locked into a specific focal range, you can't always manage to frame up the shot while utilizing the most megapixels possible, leading to either heavy cropping or frame too tight, not fitting enough information into the frame. To be completely fair, two prime lenses at different focal lengths can be used to cover an event. We see this all the time in wedding photography. They might even have better image quality and have better light gathering capabilities and a shallower depth of field compared to zoom lenses in certain scenarios. But again, you do risk losing out on a lot of opportunities between or past those specific lengths. The main reason I use zooms is to maximize my coverage abilities within an event and gather the most amount of usable images possible for my clients within the 24 to 200 millimeter range that these lenses provide. Most clients could care less about technical sharpness, blurry backgrounds, and micro contrast within the image, especially if they request specific moments or genres of shots to be captured. And if you can't capture enough clean shots to give them, chances are you're not going to be called back anytime soon. Enough of the hearsay. Let's go deeper into my experiences with each one of these lenses and some of their individual pros and cons, starting with the 16 to 55 millimeter. And this lens right here, oh good lord, this is the lens for me. The 24 to 70 millimeter equivalent Fuji Zoom is the first lens that I grab in any sort of professional scenario, hands down because of its range, its aperture, and its versatility. Now, it's not the perfect lens by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, that doesn't objectively exist. But if you were only allowed one lens for the Fuji system, this could be it. This thick, and predominantly aluminum behemoth is large in a charge at 1.44 pounds. While I'm not so thrilled about having the external zoom mechanism, the zoom ring throws consistently smooth, at least on my two copies of the lens. The aperture ring is clicky, but not too loose or too tight with hard stops at either end. It's well built and weather sealed and focuses pretty damn quickly and responsibly with its linear motor inside. Now, am I going to point this at a brick wall or a focusing mat to show you its vignetting and distortion characteristics for the next 10 minutes? No. I'm lazy, and that's been done many times before by many different outlets, and I'm not trying to hide behind any technical guys here. All I want to say is that its image quality is more than enough for me, and we're going to go through some real images and use case scenarios so you can see how this lens performs for itself. 
Now, when I say this might be the only lens you might need, I mean it. Last year, I got to shoot my dream concert with Modest Mouse thanks to winning a photo contest hosted by their amazing staff photographer, James Joyner, and Fujifilm. And this is literally the only lens I used the entire time since I knew I could trust it with my life. While shooting, I had the opportunity to be in the press pit, and I knew it would be a tight space that I had to travel as light as possible running around and sharing those tight corridors with the security team. But I knew the main performers would be blocked fairly closely to the stage front, and the 24 and 70 millimeter range would be all I needed to get things done. I mean, no matter where I was in the focal range or what aperture I was riding, all keepers from the shoot were beautifully rendered and in focus areas were tack sharp with a natural and almost unnoticeable fall off to the out of focus areas. Sure, most of the shots were not technical perfection by any means, but that usually comes down to user error, and I still had plenty of usable images by the end of the night. I mean, Technical specs be damned, there's only so much you can say about vignetting, loca, and corner sharpness in real world scenarios, and sometimes a lens performance just comes down to the user's subjective specifications. And flipping over to other event scenarios, no matter how much light or how wide of a subject field I need to cover, this lens just does the trick for me in the mid-wide to mid-telephoto range. I can isolate a single subject when I need to, or capture a very wide and dynamic scene with a variety of subjects, even at the widest apertures. If I'm playing it fast and loose in low light scenarios, I'll typically run this lens between f2.8 to f4, but I'll even bring it down to f8 in the right light when I want the best corner to corner sharpness across the zoom range. Now there are definitely issues with this lens, let's be clear. It can flare, it can get muddy wide open in the corners, there's no optical stabilization system built in, and your absolute image performance will vary between focal lengths. It can ghost, it will display some loca, and the bokeh is what I would characterize to be busy in certain scenarios, but take what I say with a grain of salt and what others say, and weigh it against your own expectations for a thousand dollar lens, and compared against your other options like buying a whole slew of prime lenses like the Fujicron F2s or even the more expensive F1.4s. But I ended up with this and I even tend to use this lens for most of my portraiture and landscape work over my 23 and 35 F1.4s because this zoom lens basically gives me the same performance at 2.8 compared to those primes, and I get the option to go between and even past those two focal lengths when shooting so I can capture the right moment when it actually happens. Now, let's take things a little further get get it with the Fujifilm 50 to 140 f 2.8 this is a 70 to 200 millimeter equivalent Fuji zoom lens and it's going to carry you through the rest of the practical focal ranges for event coverage and provide a really nice way of creating isolation for a select subject or small groups of subjects utilizing the wide aperture and the telephoto compression. Now, working in the reverse order from the 24 to 70, let's start off with just a few negatives that this lens has. This bastard can flare like no one's business in challenging back or side lighting scenarios, especially with cheap filtration on the front. And while it tends to have softer, less defined, and dare I say, just a touch, creamier background blur compared to its shorter counterpart, I've noticed a few times that it can display an oddly vintage swirly bokey pattern in select scenarios. But I mean, that's about as much flack as I can give this image quality wise, since most of its quarks tend to lend themselves to a bit of character, which is kind of hard to find on a zoom lens, especially a modern one. And it's as sharp as your weird, not uncle by blood ceremonial castration knife in the center of the frame, even wide open, and it shares a lot of the same excellent performance across its focal range. 
I like to use this lens at around f2.8 to f4, just like the 24 to 70, which is kind of the point of having a pro constant aperture zoom lens. Now, if you find yourself stepping this down any further when you're shooting, you might as well just be looking at the Fujifilm 55 to 200 millimeter, which I've done a previous episode of beating a dead horse about, which will serve you just as well in daily conditions Stop down a bit. However, chances are if you're looking at this lens because it's a constant aperture wide open speed demon that performs well no matter how you use it, this will provide you with image quality in both well-lit and low-light scenarios, which 50-200 has a little bit of an odd issue with. Uh, the 50-200 has an issue with. Huh? I really can't say enough about this lens's great optical performance. I mean, well, I can keep reiterating points already made. So let's talk about some other physical pro features that this lens has while we're at it. This is another red badge metal monster and it manages to keep its form factor very well compacted with an internal zoom mechanism which aids in its excellent weather and dust sealing capabilities. The shorter lens barrel also adds to balancing the lens out even when on the slimmer X-Pro3 style bodies, and you have an easily removable and maybe a little too easily loosened and rotatable fully metal tripod foot to help balance out the weight even more when mounted on a sling or on a tripod. Unlike the 16-55, this lens has a decent OIS system, which you will need for the long focal range, and it's even compatible with both the 1.4 and 2x teleconverters from Fujifilm. Well, I can draw out this conversation even further with talking about teleconverter performance on the 50 to 140 and videography usages for both these lenses. Let's just save those conversations for a different day. As I state in the end of all my videos, there are different strokes for different folks, and no one opinion and approach to photography will be universally suited for all. I said universally, right? Universally? Universally? If you're looking to purchasing one of these lenses, definitely check out other reviews and more technical write-ups, and I'll place a few down below that I like. Just don't buy into the hype train of one person's argument over the other, and really consider what investment makes most sense for you since spending $1,000 to $1,500 on a single lens will definitely impact your bottom line in the photo business game. If you'd like to see a more video performance focused follow up on these lenses, a deeper dive into the individual zooms, or if you think that I missed something or have your own experience with these lenses that you'd like to share, please do comment down below since I could care less about the YouTube algorithm, but I do want to know what my viewers think and are interested in. And I really do believe that the comment section is also a great way to move this conversation past the pull of my giant ego and bring more perspectives to the table. Also, if you like what you saw, consider subscribing. That might motivate me to get off my ass and make more than one video a year. This has been Ben Hytrick, and remember, Life is too short to fall for money-making schemes. Just shoot what you want to shoot and follow your own artistically perverted dreams.